So the first issue that I would like to tackle is the issue of Iran. Uh, I'd like to come straight in on a nice, easy, easy topic, uh, if I may. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so, and you'll forgive me if I if I refer to my notes uh, during our conversation, no but. Um, Mr. Secretary, you, you were and you remain a very outspoken critic of the JCPOA, uh, otherwise known as the Iran deal. You certainly remain so as director of the CIA and then Secretary of State. Uh, I would like you to tell everybody here just what it is. Everybody hears the, the phrases, right? The JCPOA is bad. We need to fix it or nix it and so forth. But I'd like you to substantively, if you would, just make a few points about what the inherent dangers of that deal were and why it was so very uh, problematic. And in your answer, uh, I'd be very grateful if you could include the malign activities of Iran now today and yeah. just how far their tentacles uh, yeah. actually reach. I'm happy to do that. First of all, thank you all for joining me. I appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, th this this set of issues that you all have gathered around this morning is something that is important to me, it's important to America, it's on my heart. When it comes to the Islamic Republic of Iran, the, the regime, and I separate that from the Iranian people, I have always thought our administration worked with the central understanding that you, you couldn't solve the problems, you couldn't create prosperity and peace in the Middle East without getting Iran right as a component of that. And the, uh, the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, a subcomponent of the Iranian problem set. So sometimes the JCPOA is substituted for, what was your Iran policy? Get, get out of the deal. No, it was much bigger and much deeper than that and, and much more nuanced as well. But it was one piece. So you know, we, we really, as we thought about the Middle East, we had three, three central understandings that I presented to the president that he ultimately let us drive down the path on. The first was nothing good happens without a unbreakable bond between the United States and Israel. You just have to get that right. No nation's going to sign anything. No, no, nobody's going to move unless they understand that America is going to have Israel's back. You have to get that piece right. And so we did it, whether it was the move of the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, whether it was the acknowledgement that uh, the Golan Heights was properly part of Israel. And I traveled to Judea and Samaria. Now I have a wine named after me. It's <laughs> phenomenal. You should know, I get no money from this thing. I got to figure out how to get that business deal right. Maybe one of you will negotiate on my behalf. Uh, we just, they're not occupiers of the space, right? All the things, right? We let people who were born in Jerusalem fix their passports to get them right. From the minute like that to the grand strategy, you have to get that piece right. Second, you have to acknowledge that, well, we want to solve the problems between Israel and the Palestinians. We're not going to let that stand in the way of success. Right. For 40 years, secretaries of state went to Ramallah, went to Jerusalem, went back and forth and tried to draw a little line a little smarter than the guys who tried to do it since 1949 or 1950. It's a fool's errand. I wasn't mm -hmm. any better at drawing some map than anybody else. Um, Abu Mazen, uh, the leader in, Pal in the West Bank, is no more willing to sign a deal with a map right than a man in the moon. And we saw what Hamas is up to, right, in Gaza Strip. It's just foolishness. And so we were going to drive on with Middle East peace. Apart from that, we knew we had some friends in the Gulf who were prepared to help us build out a coalition to counter the malign threat. And this gets to that. That's a wind up. But, but you, you can't think of these things without having this holistic vision of how you deliver good outcomes there. We knew a couple basic facts from, from my time as a soldier and my time as a congressman. The, the factor that dominates everything else in the region was Iranian malign activity. I would brief the president, CIA director. It's unusual, but I briefed him almost every day when I was in Washington. Uh, uh, and I'd walk in and I'd say, hey, there's some bad happened today in the Middle East. And he'd say, what happened? And I'd say, it was Iran. And then the next day I'd go in and I'd say, it was Iran, right? So it was Iraqi Shia militias, uh, missiles into Saudi Arabia from Yemen, fired by the Houthis. Yeah, well, they, so they were Iranian missiles. <laughs> so so he, you know, it didn't take long before he said, that hey, we got to fix that. And uh, so we set about trying to fix it. And the core way was just to deny them wealth and resources and support the Iranian people. And you couldn't do those two things so long as you were in this crappy deal. Mm -hmm. And so you, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a naive understanding of the Iranian regime. If you, ex, if you think the Iranian regime is changeable in the short run, then you'd say, well, if we can just get three, two, seven years where they can't buy high-end weapon systems and they might not build out fissile material and enrich uranium, then this is a good deal because we'll kick the can and we'll live for seven more years. 
the malign activity that's taking place. Right? We saw that we saw assassination campaigns in Europe. Uh, we, we saw what happened. They tried to take an American. Right? We just saw DOJ's indictment yesterday of four Iranians operating here in the United States of America. Just think about the brazenness of op- the Iranian regime thinking they can freely operate in the United States of America and trying to take an American back, obviously to be killed or held in Evan prison. Uh, this is a regime you can't sit in Vienna and negotiate about the terms of, well, maybe you won't enrich past a certain percentage for a certain period of time. This is silliness. Um, and we were going to have any of it. So we denied them that the Iranians say $100 billion in wealth, and we built out a coalition to put Iran in a place where it is as isolated as it had ever been in history. And no one, <laughs> I was a young soldier. I patrolled the East German border when I was a soldier. I, no one knew the day that that fence was going to come down, even days before it did. No one knows when the Iranian people will be successful at gaining their freedom, but that day was on its way to coming. And now I fear we're going to, we're going to, give them the fuel, the regime, the fuel it needs to continue down its uh, bloody path of creating chaos throughout the Middle East and trying to create a, uh, right, they talk about having five capitals. They're well on their way to doing that. And uh, the United States is the only nation that is capable of securing America from that threat and securing our friend and ally Israel from that threat as well. A couple of other questions on that subject. It, It seems utterly bizarre that the current administration is, is so almost uh, obsessive, suddenly determined to start the work of re-entering the JCPOA. And even more bizarrely is the, bizarre is the fact that President-elect uh, Raisi of uh, Iran is the individual saying no. What accounts for this pursuit of re-entry into that agreement with all of the problems that you've just elucidated upon? I try to be charitable. I'm going to struggle on this one. I can't explain it. It has become an article of faith. It is now a talisman. Trump walked away from the deal. We're going to go back in it is, frankly, the most likely reason that they're they're so wedded to it. Second, almost everybody that is a senior person in the administration working on national security was central to this, right? So Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, was the very human being who was in Muscat, Oman, in early years of the Obama administration working on this deal. And this is personal for him. This, this was, he spent his life doing this, his adult life. And so you all know that you become wedded to things and you become irrational. Re-entering this deal is completely irrational. Most of the things expire in just a handful of years. It, it's, it's, um, th- there's nothing other than it's just become something that they have to go do because we took a different path and they need to go course correct. You add to that, you have elements within their party who don't see the Middle East in the same way. They would see Israel as a malign actor as well, and they'd say, can't we all just get along, and why be so mean to the Iranians? And so you see that piece uh, from the progressive elements of the Democrat Party, and that is not based on any logic that I can articulate for you here this morning. So, Mr. Secretary, one of the things that former Prime Minister Netanyahu always said was that a crippling sanctions program, which you've certainly ratcheted up, must be accompanied by a credible military threat. Two-part question. One, how credible is a military threat to Iran's nuclear facilities? And two, if the state of Israel had attacked those facilities during your tenure as Secretary of State, how much support would they have had from that administration? So those are very easy questions. So the military capability absolutely exists. It is only about intent and willingness. Uh, Lots of smart people on both uh, the Israeli MOD side and our Department of Defense side have been working this problem set for a long time. You you should know that the capability to go take out the Iranian nuclear program fully exists. It's not an easy task. It's not like OSIRAC. It's not where you had, you know, a, a... uh, a nuclear facility sitting in the desert, and you could do it in the stealth of night with half a dozen aircraft. It is a much bigger, much heavier lift, but it's completely achievable. Uh, second, had the Israelis made this decision, the United States would have done everything we can to make sure that they achieved an American objective, which is to make sure Iran never becomes a nuclear state. Right? So this isn't just an Israeli objective, it's an American-stated foreign policy objective. Indeed, even this administration has that as a stated 
foreign policy objective. We do not Iran, want Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, so those two questions are really easy. How our administration would have handled it, one can never predict, but I am very confident I know the answer to that. I, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I would have gotten a call from the prime minister saying, hey, you need to come see me. And uh, we would have had an important conversation. Uh, one last thing I would say. That's a hard task. It is a very hard task for the Israelis to do alone. Very, very difficult. They need... There's lots of things that we are better to, I, I try to say this in an unclassified setting this way. There are many things that we can do more successfully together than either of us can do alone because mm -hmm. we have very complementary skill sets. Mm -hmm. uh, that holds true in the military world. It's why I became such good friends with Yossi Cohen at Mossad. There were just things we could do together that neither of us could do. The CIA was big and huge and then had all these legal restrictions. And Israel was lethal and powerful and had a lot more freedom <laughs> to do lots of really fun things. And, uh, and so, uh, and so I, you know, we, we just, we built out a partnership over my time and service at CA that is somebody, somebody will write the book someday. We made our two countries both safer and more secure. There is no doubt about that. We knew we had two leaders in Netanyahu and Trump that would let these two guys go out and do really good, important work and lay the foundations for intelligence operations and, and work on the ground that, that has already done really important things to make life harder for the regime. But, but I mentioned this, I, I never wanted, I, we always wanted to work to make sure we never force Prime Minister Netanyahu or the Israeli government to have to make that hard decision. Mm -hmm. We never wanted to put them in a place where they felt like they had to go do this. And th that was our deterrent model, which said, if we can build out the Gulf state relationships and isolate Iran, then Israel will always feel like it can delay its need to go take on this really, really difficult task. And we wanted to make sure that we pulled every arrow from the quiver before we put them in a place where they had to come and say, it's time we, we have to go do more than just steal their documents. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a very interesting answer. And I won't delve deeper into it. I'll just put out there. It does raise the question of given the capability and the alliance behind the legitimacy, it of course raises the question of, is the intent there? But mm -hmm. we can talk about that perhaps if time remains at the can end. Can I say one more thing about this? Yeah. You should know that relationship has already changed. The, rela the relationships between our security services have already changed. When the Israelis took some actions, what now, two and a half, three months ago, I, I can't say this for sure, but I am highly confident that they didn't notify the Americans. Too, too complicated, right? Too hard. Who knows what they're going to say? Right? I mean, they're probably not going to tell them, no, don't do it, but they may well say, hey, not on Wednesday. Or, right? So the, the relationship, the confidence in each other, it would have been an easy conversation for me to have with Israeli leadership to say, hey, let's think our way through this. Let's go work on this, because they would have known I was acting in good faith to deliver really good outcomes for both of our two countries. They don't have the confidence in that today. Mm. And that's... Uh, that, that is already putting America at risk and obviously putting Israel at more risk and under more pressure as well. We saw it when the rockets launched from Gaza. They, they got, you know, the administration ultimately got to a pretty good place. I want to credit them for that. But at the same time, they're turning on money to the Palestinians through UNRWA. This is nuts. That, that money is going to go for terror that will take place somewhere, likely in Israel, to reward the Palestinian leadership for for slaying Israelis and Jewish people. I, I just, I can't get to the logic. I, I can often do this. I can often hit a debate and I say, sure, I'll play the other side. I can't do it on this one. You alluded to the Abraham Accords and your outreach to the Sunni states. Tell us, the prevailing sentiment in this room, Mr. Secretary, is probably that the JCPOA was a bad idea, okay? But one of the positives seems to have been that it laid the, the foundation for the Sunni states that felt threatened by it to forge this alliance or this normalization with the state of Israel. Talk us through how that process was. And when did you see that what had been under the table cooperation yeah. became ripe for ratification and ceremony? Yeah. So this is actually the sentiment, the understanding that the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians was was a tired, endless debate, was something that had been known to Arab leaders for an awfully long time. They, they knew that the West Bank folks were no more than going to sign a deal than a man in the moon for an awfully long time. 
But they were always afraid of their street, and they were afraid that the Americans wouldn't be supportive because we always sent our Secretary of State, by the way, under Democrat and Republican alike, not partisan, <clears throat> to go negotiate, right? To go find the magic formula to convince the Palestinian leadership to do something that they, they didn't want to do. Because if you do that deal, you're not the leader anymore, and you, your third home in Paris isn't going, to be as, mm. isn't going to be as nice. I mean, let's just be honest about the... We, you have to be honest. This was the, the great thing about being President Trump's Secretary of State, is that we could just be real. <laughs> we could say, yeah, he's got a really nice house in the suburbs of Paris. Where'd that money come from? Mm. So that'd be the American taxpayers. Uh, Right. We could, we, could, we could be just honest about the things we were doing. And you know, we would still continue down some, some things that you, you always have to compromise. But, man, it was fun to just be refreshingly real and go work on these problems in a very real way. The Abraham Accords were a function of that. So we put out our, our plan, right? And, but we said to the Palestinians, here's the deal. Take it or leave it because we're moving on. And the Arab states loved it. They also knew that if they needed Patriot missile batteries to try and defend against uh, Iranian missiles coming out of Yemen, that we were going to provide them not only the batteries, but the training and skill set. And even if they needed American contractors, we were going to do that too. So they, were, they knew they had an ally. And we knew that we could work through the Israeli relationships too, that says if the Emiratis feel like they need the F-35, we'll convince the Israelis that those planes are going to be flying in tandem, not adverse to each other. And it took a long time, right? This takes confidence building measures that had to be put in place. And, you know, if you... It, 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 you can't go through everything in the room, but you can imagine when I, you're sitting with the crown prince in the Emirates and he says, but Mike, you could be gone in a year and a half. I could be living in a very different Middle East if a new administration comes in. And yeah, that's the math. That's the date on the calendar. That's, that's, that, that's a, a real risk. But we're able to convince them all that there was enough support, bipartisan support inside the United States that we could deliver good security outcomes from them. And if they would step across the line and strike these arrangements that life would be better for the people of Bahrain or the people of Sudan or the people of Morocco or the people of the Emirates. Uh, the Saudis were big players in this as well. And while they did not sign the accord, you, you can see the handwriting on the wall. But without American leadership and American relationship with Israel that is strong and unshakable, they'll, they'll never cross the line. Because when all heck breaks loose in Mecca, right? this is the fear, when you say, yes, we're going to recognize Israel as the Jewish homeland, and properly a nation state, the risk is that all heck breaks loose in Mecca. And here's what you cannot have when that happens. You can't have the Americans be weak. America has to come and help them and be ready to support them and deliver them. And they may have to do some really hard things inside of their own country. And they need to know that the United States is going to have their back in delivering on that so that they can continue to do the things they need to do to take their nation out of the century that they've been in and move those Arab states to the next century as well, which is what the leadership in the Emirates clearly made as their decision. And you see it, you see commercial activity, you all, mm. some of you probably making money selling real estate to Emiratis in Tel Aviv, God bless you. <laughs> they opened the embassy there yesterday or the day before. It's good stuff. Uh, that, that part's not going back. Everybody can see the fruits of it. And so that's a, that's a wonderful thing. So my next question is asked in the context of you no longer being the Secretary of State, and perhaps you can be a little bit more open about your own views. I asked for the folks who were not in the VIP section, I asked the Secretary about his faith, uh, which is very important. It's an important aspect of who you are and, and your, your principled policies. The Peace to Prosperity Plan, oftentimes referred to as the deal of the century, Yes, some people, by our admirers. Yes. By, right. <laughs> some people, many people, view that as the most pro-Israel plan ever to be put on the table. There are some issues with it, though, and I wanted to ask about that. Number one, it certainly called for or spoke to the possibility of the establishment of a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria. It also spoke to the possibility of a partition of Jerusalem, albeit among, along specific lines, and it also called for the ceding of land under certain conditions. Yep. Uh, in this case, around the periphery of the Gaza Strip, along the Padran Desert. Now, that was the brainchild primarily of Jared Kushner, Jason Greenblatt, David Friedman. There were two other individuals who usually would have that very much on their lap. One would be the Secretary of State, the other would be perhaps the Vice President Mike Pence, mm -hmm. both men of tremendous faith and with Israel as a central plank of that faith. Did 
those concessions impact upon your enthusiasm for that plan in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> Uh, so I have made a living not talking about internal discussions in the administration. Uh, survived for four years, you should know, right? Five secretaries of defense, yes. four national security advisors, only two secretaries of state. Uh, there's, no, there's no accident there. But, I, but here's what I'll say as Mike. Uh, those are very troubling ideas to me as an evangelical Christian. Each of the things that you outline there, uh, have you an undivided Jerusalem as historic and faith grounded and morally right. And so they were, they were troubling. You should know Ambassador Friedman, you, you sort of drew, drew the alignment. Uh, Ambassador Friedman and I were actually in the same place on this set of issues. These were big debates. Uh, and while I think it was the most pro-Israel uh, program put forward, it was also the most pro-Palestinian program put forward in the sense of we were trying to create better opportunities for every human being. Right? Regardless of their faith or regardless of their circumstances, we wanted to help the Palestinians be more successful as well. But a couple of us weren't prepared to do that on uh, a set of terms. You, the moment that came out, you should know that every senior uh, national level evangelical pastor in America was in the queue for a call from Mike Pompeo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you realize what's in this? Y yes, sir, I, I do. <laughs> I do realize. And so we were working to try to put that in a place that had a better historical set of understandings. But there, there was compromise contained in it. There's, there's no doubt about that. Different subject, actually not build. China. I think it would be remiss of me not to ask you about China. Our organization recently hosted a, an interview of General Stanley McChrystal, former commander of ISAF, mm -hmm. And he was an advisor, I don't know to what extent, but an advisor during the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And it was just after that period of, of advice, uh, advice that he was dispensing that we interviewed him. And in that conversation, he expressed that he did not believe that the United States of America has the ability or will, absent very significant alliances, to confront a rising China. My concern is that that position, while it may be legitimate, may not be legitimate, it may be an attitude that has now permeated the administration. What's your view on that? It always start at the beginning. The beginning is 1972. Dr. Kissinger, who I am an enormous admirer of and was a great help to me as Secretary of State, heads America down a path, and we never looked back and said what made sense in the 80s or the 90s or the early 2000s doesn't make sense anymore. And so I know this is anathema here in New York, but this is going to cost us a lot to confront the Chinese Communist Party, and we have no choice but to do it. Mm. And I don't know how else to put it. We, we, we've got all kinds of... The, Iran is, is troubling Vladimir Putin, who I spent too much time with, He's a former KGB guy. He's going to go conduct ransomware stuff against us. Chairman Kim, who I now have spent more time with than any other American, including Dennis Rodman, uh, <laughs> uh, he's a bad guy. <clears throat> None of those can destroy our republic. The Chinese Communist Party not only can, but is intent on doing that. And so, I, you know, I, I think Stanley McChrystal's defeatist proposition, that's what you described there, has permeated this administration. And so they are going to do their best to just either kick the can down the road, which is dangerous, or worse yet, uh, sup become supplicant. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what Xi Jinping wants. And so my urging, and we made progress, although just a lot of work to do. This is a decades-long proposition, just like the defeat of the Soviet Union was. Right? Ron, Ronald Reagan said, we win, they lose. Xi Jinping has now said, we win, they lose. So... Xi Jinping's in this. People say, Are we, do you want to go to war with China? It says, it depends, but they're at war with us. And we have pension funds investing billions, building out their war machine. No nation's ever done something this stupid, literally stupid, for, to their own people. To help build out the Chinese war machine. Just listen to what the guy says. He says, anybody who oppresses the Chinese, we're not oppressing the Chinese. We're buying their stuff. We're sending investment bankers there to help create wealth for them. We're letting them steal our technology. We're not oppressing the Chinese. We let them in the WTO on terms that no other nation got in under. 
No, we're, we're, we're the primary fuel for the Chinese economic growth project. And so we, there, there, there will have to be an American uh, reset. Uh, no other country is going to do it. If you think the French and the Germans are going to lead the fight against the Chinese, I'll sell you a bridge not far from here. Uh, this is going to take American leadership. And we can buy plastic trinkets from them, eh, whatever. But your kids are on TikTok. You should know they own your kids' data. You should just know they own it. And you accept that, that's fine. If you've had you or your, uh, or your wife or uh, your daughter has taken a pregnancy test to two or three major companies that conduct these tests, China has your D their DNA. They're collecting it, and they're using AI to build up models. This is, this is stuff that we haven't seen since, since the 1930s in Germany in terms of how they think about genetics in the world and their attempt to dominate. So this is the challenge of our lifetimes. This administration has shown no indication that they're prepared to confront this. They've mapped the right words. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you one, one more example that's just, just so plain. There's this big fight about where did the Wuhan virus originate. I knew in February of 2020 that it was, you all are math guys, right? You all do real estate deals and the like. Um, this was a 90-10 laydown that it came from the lab with the information that I had in front of me in February of 2020. I spoke about it publicly in April of 2020. I was pilloried by the Washington Post and the New York Times and everybody in between. I was racist, trying to deflect from the virus. It's facts. This was just data. If I write about the origin of the virus, it bolsters my next claim. And my next claim is one that says it doesn't matter where it came from. It came from China and was knowingly exported from China to the world. Think about this. In January of 2020, they sent 15 senior leaders to stand in the Oval Office. Remember this? We were completing the phase one trades deal. Li Hui, the Chinese trade negotiator, was standing with the president of the United States when the Chinese knew about this virus. We knew precious little about it in early January of 2020. And they sent 15 leaders to infect, potentially, America's most senior leaders. Think about that. We would never send, if, if we just sent folks to China when we knew we had a virus, I mean, uh, uh, you couldn't, there aren't, enough, there aren't enough vehicles to drive in and out of the UN for all the hearings that would be held to pillory the United States of America. They knowingly exported this. They put people from Wuhan, where I had 14 State Department officials that we had to ultimately go rescue from Wuhan and 80 other Americans, an amazing operation that the State Department ran. Uh, they exported people from Wuhan to Milan knowingly, knowing that they possessed and were ill with a virus that was highly contagious and significantly lethal at that point in time. Anybody ever look at our laws about if you get in a car drunk and kill someone? You don't have to try to kill them. You just have to know you got in a car drunk and someone died. The Chinese have now killed millions of people around the world. And the world just kind of says, I wonder if I can do another deal there. This is a stunning piece of uh, information that the world must take on board, that they murdered six million people, at the very least knowingly. There's not a DA in New York that wouldn't take that case for felony murder. Not one. You could prove it out with information that is public and unclassified. And I, I mention this with all the seriousness intended because it's just symptomatic of their absence of caring about human life. And they're their deep understanding that they can get away with things no other nation can get away with, and the world will look the other way because they've got a market of a middle class, about six or 700 million middle class people, and huge wealth that they can distribute around the world through their state-owned enterprises and control and dominate the information space everywhere, including the United States of America. So you all are going to be my partners in confronting this. It's just a question of if we do it today or we start half a dozen years from now when it'll be a much harder problem set. So, Mr. Secretary, I want to be very mindful of your time. Amazingly, I have not received a single cue card, but yes. I did give a promise to a couple, to one individual, sure. two individuals. And so I'd like to ask, just as I take a question from Mr. Schachter, your question, please, Mr. Schachter. And, and yes, there sir. is a microphone here, and it's on. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for your efforts and congratulations on your success with the Abraham Accords. You basically, I think, answered this question, but just to hear it very clearly, do you think the Saudis will normalize, and if so, when? 
I do believe that the Saudis will normalize. I don't do timelines <laughs> because you're destined to be wrong, long or short. I do think the Saudis will. There are, the right way to say this, none of these agreements would have taken place without the Saudis saying, yes, we think this is the right direction we'll allow you to go. It's not that they own and control. It's not an agency issue. But there they are, the 500-pound gorilla there. And so the conversations we're having with each of these nations included conversations that were being had between us, them, the Saudis, and sort of a complex set of conversations. So the Saudis are very comfortable with the direction that the Arab states are going in. And they'll, they'll get there too. It's just a much deeper, more complicated problem. The king is still alive, right? So the king is still very much has influence over this important issue to the, king, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, so yeah, I think they'll get there. I, I couldn't tell if it would be next year or 10 years from now. I don't know. So thank you very much. We have five minutes. I, may I say one more thing before we, yes. we, we close out? So I, I get when people listen to me, my, my wife always jokes that I've sold more Xanax than you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because it, you can stare at this and go back to your family and say, all is lost. I, I believe just the opposite of this. I, I believe just 180 degrees from this. I believe that recognition of, this, of the nature of these threats, as well as the threats here to our republic at home, is it's the first step in the 12-step program, right? I have a problem. The United States is the most amazing, amazing organism, the most amazing nation state in the history of mankind. I am confident that the reality, if we will, we will, we will raise leaders up, not just in government, but in business and in mm -hmm. synagogues and churches and mosques all across America who are committed to the project of securing American freedom and developing this set of relationships around the world, starting with Israel, that will secure American freedom, I'm convinced we'll crush it. But if we turn away, if we say, no, let's just go look away from this and allow some of these bad actors the freedom to conduct their activity and undermine our republic, then, then there's risk. Uh, when I go out, I'm, I travel this afternoon, I'm going to Minnesota to, to help a couple candidates. I end up in Iowa tonight for a day tomorrow. I'm in Missouri on Saturday or Sunday, and then on to Florida, helping candidates who believe in the same things I've spoken about this morning, be more successful, have a little more resource and money to do that. Uh, I'm convinced that the American people will get this right. And I hope it's across a broad bipartisan basis. This China problem in particular is going to take every American. If this becomes a Republican issue, Xi Jinping mm -hmm. will be happy. And I don't want it. I want this to be a, an American issue. I'm convinced America will prevail in these things and that the, the good people, the good people who have democracies and religious tolerance, people like in the United States and Israel, when we join together and work together, uh, we, we will ultimately prevail against this evil that threatens us. And it means we have to pray and work. And if we do those two things, good stuff will happen. So I didn't want to leave anybody the impression that I am short America. I am long America, big time. And I am, I'm convinced that we'll get it right. And the time is now to begin to continue to work on that project. From your lips to God's ears, thank you very much. Um. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.